Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining this evening's call. Um, this is Jessica Dudley, Director of Chicago African Americans in Philanthropy. I want to thank you for taking the time tonight to be with us. Um, this month, we have done a series of calls on COVID-19. And if you missed any of those previous calls, I hope that you will sign up for our newsletter or check our website for the recordings of those calls. Really excited to be joined by Skills for Chicagoland's Future tonight. The thing Think about the future of work, understand what is happening across our state, and understand how COVID-19 has impacted our local job market. I know that we'll have a few more people joining us as we get started, but I want to hand it over to our guest speaker, Io, to get us started with an introduction of the work that Skills is doing um, and get us into the, into the meat of our conversation for tonight. Io. Thank you, Jessica. Am I unmuted now? You're all set. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, so thank you uh, to Cape and thank you to uh, Jessica for uh, inviting uh, me on behalf of Skills to talk about COVID-19 uh, uh, and the future of work. Uh, can we move on to the next slide? Um, I wanted to sort of start off uh, by, by level setting uh, Skills uh, and why we're here. Um, uh, so before I get too far, um, uh, again, Ayom Siengo, uh, Vice President of Community and Strategic Partnerships here at Skills. Uh, I'll also be joined uh, by my colleague, Daniel Cervantes, who is the Senior Vice President of, of Programs uh, here at Skills. Um, so for those who don't know, uh, Skills, uh, Skills is a demand-driven uh, uh, nonprofit here in the city of Chicago that looks out across all of Chicagoland uh, with a focus on uh, neighborhoods that are experiencing high unemployment and high uh, poverty rates, looks to connect first uh, with employers. So we start with the job, uh, we lift up what that demand uh, is, and then we work uh, with a number of partners across the region uh, to connect uh, job-ready individuals to, uh, to, to work. Uh, we strongly believe uh, that a zip code should not determine uh, your opportunities. And with 70 to 80% of jobs, uh, filled through networking um, and having myself been, frankly, in, uh, in workforce for, frankly, what's, what's looking like it's going to be my, my entire career, um, you know, who you know uh, is, is super important. We, you know, Skills is lucky to be able to be that conduit by which uh, actively hiring employers can be connected to, uh, to, to be talented. And that's, that's the premise uh, for which Skills uh, uh, was created, uh, sort of a way to connect uh, uh, job seekers uh, to that solution uh, and ensure uh, that we are contributing to, uh, to household success. Uh, look, 7,500 residents have been placed into employment uh, and thousands more uh, have been served. Uh, and 70% of, of the folks that we serve uh, come from the south uh, and west sides of Chicago, something that we'll bring back uh, a little later uh, in our conversation. Uh, Jessica, could you move on to the next slide? As we sort of start to think uh, through what, what this current moment is, and I, we, we've all been sort of in, in a similar spot, um, you know, 36 million people since mid-March, right, uh, have, have filed uh, unemployment claims. Uh, as we looked at this data, both locally uh, and, and nationally, uh, you know, we're, we're also wrestling with the fact that it's not just folks who have, uh, who are sort of uh, in the picture of, um, uh, of being just separated from the job. We're also tracking uh, folks who are, uh, who have not looked for, for work in the last four weeks. We're looking at folks who have gone through a temporary layoff uh, and are expected to be called, uh, be recalled within the next, uh, you know, six months. Uh, you know, prior to COVID, we were already talking about certain neighborhoods in Chicago that were grappling with double digit employment. Um, this, this loss is not just taking uh, an economic toll on, on communities, um, but it's also taking uh, an emotional uh, and, and mental toll uh, uh, on job seekers. Um, you know, as we, or ne next slide please, uh, Jessica, as we sort of pause and think uh, about the people and households that have been affected, uh, what, what we're also grappling with is um, what, what that's gonna look like uh, uh, in the future. You know, the, these are not just numbers uh, for us as we look at this statewide uh, data and as we grapple with this, 
while we are but one organization amongst many in the city of Chicago proper, uh, you know, we, we are tracking this. You know, part, part of our role uh, is to connect uh, uh, people uh, who are quote unquote job ready and to ensure that they have a path back, uh, back to work. But again, as we have taken in this data, as we've, as we've looked at the picture of, of what this is going to turn into for job seekers and the relationship with employers, uh, these are the things that we track uh, on a weekly basis. These are the things that we are uh, consistently uh, going over as we think through not only what's happening uh, to our local labor markets, to our local economies, not just what's happening to uh, you know, job seekers who are on the edge, who are entry level, but what can our, what can our response be, right? Not just as skills, but in partnership uh, with all of our partners. Uh, if you can move me on to the next slide, uh, Jessica. The, uh, the, the thing that we are really thinking through uh, uh, at Skills, but I know a lot of us are, uh, are, are doing as well, uh, is thinking, look, it, it, all, the, all of Chicago area uh, is at risk. And what we mean by that is, A, we're watching the unemployment rate uh, go up for certain populations. We're tracking how this is affecting older workers, older workers who uh, are, are on the cusp uh, of retirement and are in danger of, uh, of, of going into retirement uh, poor or becoming poor if they can even afford to, uh, to, to retire. And obviously, uh, the, the way that this is going to shape uh, and shift uh, the, the labor market is going to be uh, the, the plight of, of young workers, right? So one thing we're tracking is as, as adult wage earners or older, more mature wage earners uh, have to reshift and refocus and take on uh, jobs that maybe they didn't take on before, as we saw uh, in, in the previous recession, how that's going to uh, disrupt what young people uh, uh, were looking at. Uh, as far as uh, stepping into uh, stepping into an occupation, uh, we're, we're also taking a, a hard look at uh, what this is doing to uh, Latinx uh, and African American uh, uh, both workers and and communities, and thinking through what our response uh, uh, can be. Um, look, women uh, and people of color earning less than forty thousand uh, dollars per year. Uh, not only are they more likely to be affected, but they're also in what we're calling these vulnerable jobs, right? Uh, those individuals working jobs less than earning less than forty thousand job uh, dollars per year uh, are, are in a group uh, that is seventy percent most more, more likely uh, to to be uh, in a vulnerable occupation. Uh, and lastly, again, this notion of older workers uh, who are going to be at risk of poverty in retirement. Um, you know, when, when, you, when you think about uh, at least the, the, the work that we do and the work that we are partnered with, uh, with our partners across the city, uh, you know, we're not simply focused on, on one population. Whereas, you know, Skills was born uh, in the recession and we started off uh, sort of uh, working with uh, sort of uh, mature uh, workers. Uh, over the years, we've really grown the number of people that we've worked with uh, to include, uh, you know, recent high school graduates, recent college graduates, uh, those who are entry level, mid career, and mature in their career, and so we're looking at the continuum uh, of individuals. We're also looking uh, as best we can. Look, it's all of Chicago, but for, uh, prior to COVID, if you could make it to Skills, uh, we we could do our best uh, to serve you. So while we are located in the Loop, um, you know, individuals who are coming to us, uh, who are able to get to us, uh, can uh, can be served. Uh, Jessica, could you could you take us to the next slide? This one is 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 really important, and I really want to uh, sort of pause here just a little bit as we look around the corner and think about what uh, you know what might be coming uh, our way. Uh, look, leaders, uh, those of us who who feel that we are in a position to <clears throat> to to guide change. We're, we're grappling with this number where you see we are here. And in fact, that number has uh, of, of 757 that we've noted is actually a, above a million. Um, where we're at right now is we're, we're, we're watching sort of three, three big waves. Uh, number one, uh, we're watching the unemployed who will find work in independently. Uh, they, they will figure out a way. We're watching the unemployed served uh, by the workforce system. And then we're seeing just a tidal wave of individuals that are unserved 
and unemployed. And whereas right now, some of those folks are receiving uh, uh, unemployment uh, insurance extensions, we are very much so watching very closely the end of the un unemployment extension. And it's not just skills who is readying itself for frankly what we're calling the wave of individuals who are going to be seeking out assistance. Um, uh, but we're also grappling uh, with uh, the other side, the, the things that we don't control, which is the, the health side of, uh, of this pandemic. And so as we watch these numbers sort of shoot up, uh, and as, uh, as we sort of, I think, come to, to a sense of uh, grappling with what this new normal is beginning to shape up, uh, what we're also then again watching is what sort of part two of this is going to be. And again, take away the health crisis. Uh, again, uh, the, the number of jobs that were lost in a four-week period uh, going back to uh, the last recession, that is what we are going to have to be in a rebuilding uh, phase for uh, as of right now. Uh, but again, we are not skills. Obviously, it's not the only ones uh, that, that are engaged uh, in looking at this, but this is what the sector uh, is looking at, right? We're talking about the, the entire system uh, is bracing itself, quite frankly, and it's not uh, just individuals who are going to come back to the system and go to work uh, because we know uh, that that's not going to be uh, uh, the ticket. If we move on to the next slide, um, we, we know that there's going to be an imbalance. The number of folks who are going to be looking for work is going to far outpace the number of available jobs. And so the question becomes, then what, do we, what are we going to do with them? Again, 36.9 million in uninsurance claims uh, nationally, a million plus unemployment claims in Illinois, a 33% drop in new job postings. Now, the one interesting thing is we've seen employers continue to hire throughout this time, but again, the number of jobs that are available to individuals uh, has gone down significantly. And of course, with hiring taking a back seat uh, to, uh, to, to where we are, to, to business strategy, it then begs the question for how we are going to get uh, get out of this. Now, the the, the arc uh, of this and the aggregate, I think, of, of what we're pointing to here is there's going to have to be uh, another way. As we sort of start to prepare ourselves, we, we lost a, a number of jobs very quickly, and we're going to have to figure out and align with employers as to what uh, what the next step uh, is going to be. And Jessica, if we go back to the next step, next slide, uh, what I do want to point to is uh, at, at least at, at skills. One of the ways that we're thinking about this is, again, we want to continue to take uh, demand from employers, uh, but we also want to be linked uh, with our, um, uh, with, with other anchor institutions uh, uh, in the sector. Uh, what are we going to do with young people? So there is a, there, there's obviously a story that we're following uh, where individuals that are in school, uh, in college, uh, are choosing to, uh, to defer, right? They're unable to really see around the corner. Uh, they're unable to see over the hill. Uh, and fr frankly, they're, they're choosing to either defer or drop out of school completely. These are, in many cases, young people uh, who we still need in the workforce. And if we're calling it a gap year, what are we going to fill uh, with that gap year? Uh, when it comes to education, the to and through pathways, uh, how are we going to be connecting uh, job seekers to the skills, right, that employers are demanding so that this region can remain competitive? Uh, and, and what's that role uh, going to be? Uh, look, each year, uh, and again, skills specific, uh, we're seeing upwards of 20 and now 30,000 people per year. We're trying to figure out a way that we can connect folks, not just to jobs in this period, but to all of the resources that will right size your household uh, and or you as an individual um, as we get this economy back on track. Again, as I mentioned before, employers continue uh, to reach out to us. So, so one of the first things that we sort of realized as we pivoted now, don't get me wrong, we did have some employers uh, who had to uh, pause, right, who had to stop, uh, cease operations for the time being, or at least cease, cease hiring uh, for the time being. Uh, and we had some who just had to slow down. Uh, but we also have had other employers who uh, stood up with significant demand and have continued to show that demand uh, throughout this entire time. And so we're still able to drive people uh, to work. We're still working with our partners. 
to, uh, to identify our community partners, to identify uh, job ready talents and then connect them to, uh, to employers. Now, is it happening at the same level as it had been happening up until now? Unfortunately, it is not. Uh, but the important thing is uh, it continues to happen. Uh, and the, even more important is that um, as we grapple, and as we come to terms with what this moment is, uh, even more employers are sort of determining um, how, how things look. But again, we, we, have, a, we have a long way to go. Uh, the trades, right? The role of the trades and the role of apprenticeships. Look, we, we are rethinking uh, what it means to go to, uh, to work. And again, we want to be an advocate uh, look, the, these programs existed already, um, and we want to figure out how we can not simply connect people to, uh, you know, the employers that we're connecting them to, but also connect them to, uh, to the pathways uh, that we are also uh, driving. Um, another thing that seems to be bubbling up as well is, look, in, in this uh, current moment, uh, again, with the imbalance of jobs to, uh, to interest, uh, right, and individuals looking to go to work, What's the role of earn and learn going to be? What's the role of, you know, sort of these uh, micro education uh, moments while individuals can be uh, paid, right? Either stipended or, uh, or, or details TBD. Uh, we really want to be part of that solution uh, to ensure uh, that individuals are able to uh, provide uh, something for the household while gaining uh, these, again, in-demand skills that they're going to need uh, in, in the future economy that's really hopefully going to be coming uh, in a relatively short time uh, once, uh, once we find a cure. And lastly, we're also thinking through not just what's the role of social safety nets, uh, of social uh, uh, assistance, uh, but also how, could we, how can people be driving themselves to work uh, in this area? But again, what is the overarching role uh, going to be for all these folks? And so the reason we share this with you uh, here on this call is because it, there's not just going to be one way. I think we all acknowledge that, uh, but the way in which we're thinking about it is there's going to be a number of ways in which organizations like Skills uh, are, are going to be able to be truly helpful, truly uh, additive to the job seeking public, and it's not merely going to be, uh, you know, in, in a business intermediary role, right? So we will retain that role, uh, but there's going to be so much more that we're going to be called upon to do, and we're thinking through it all. Um, right now. Uh, Jessica, if you move on to slide nine, what I'll share with you with, uh, on this call is sort of how we responded um, uh, immediately. So look, uh, in, in the very early days, uh, we, we were able to add eight new business clients. This is, this is important because we were, we were still grappling with what it was going to mean to go back to work, what the demand was, not just from businesses, but also from people looking for work. Um, and what we saw was uh, a significant spike in the number of individuals visiting our website, a significant spike in the number of CBOs, community-based organizations that we work with who were emailing us, calling us, wanting to continue to place their, uh, place their job-ready candidates uh, into work. And we were, of course, looking at uh, the safety aspect, um, and we wanted to connect people with, again, in-demand uh, employers, um, but also place them into, uh, into roles uh, where they would be able to be thrive and be as healthy uh, uh, as possible. Uh, also important to note, uh, we, we quickly pivoted uh, to being open virtually. Uh, and there was some discussion about this. Uh, and what we wanted to figure out was how we could do things just like this Zoom call using Teams, um, not just to communicate between ourselves, but to communicate with job seekers and then connect them to, uh, to employers um, and we, we've continued to send uh, people to work uh, essentially this entire period. Um, uh, you know, we were able to, uh, to, to assist uh, the city of Chicago, uh, not just with the um, uh, ramping up uh, of the McCormick uh, Place Hospital, uh, but also uh, with some of their other operations, uh, such as a safe haven, um, and have been able to be uh, uh, an employer uh, of record uh, around essential workers uh, who are needed throughout this period. Um, and we've even even helped us sort of align uh, around the infrastructure for uh, for a temp agency. One of the things I've mentioned on, on, on this call is we have you know we 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 are demand driven. Uh, we're a business intermediary, which means again that we work uh, with the businesses first. Um, and you know part of following demand means that we are tuned into uh, uh, to, to where work is shifting. Um, and one of the initial 
uh, sort of pathways that we were following was, look, uh, everybody, and, and us included, uh, wants to be going to, uh, to, to work full time, uh, but there, there's a shift in the market uh, and employers with, with employers not having a good idea uh, of where the future looks, um, uh, temporary, uh, temporary uh, employment uh, is gonna be big. A lot of folks who, who are going to be going to work uh, at least throughout the rest of this year forecasted uh, will be working temporary jobs, contract jobs, and you know, certainly in better times, you know, the, these, are, uh, the, these are options that we uh, have always sort of looked at, but right now, this is what employers are, are, are calling upon uh, their employees to really think through. And so as we think about the arc, as we think about how we're connecting job-ready job seekers to employment, um, really aligning them with the idea that this could be our reality, especially when we think about uh, entry-level and mid-level jobs, this could be how things are, are shaking up uh, in, in the interim. Uh, and so we are working very closely with our CBO partners to get on the same page with them so that they are preparing their job seekers for what this new uh, emerging uh, market is. Uh, I'll also pause there to say, uh, you know, we're, we're also seeing folks go to, go to work full time, but again, we're bringing in this new layer of, of temporary work, um, of contract work, uh, et cetera. Um, uh, Want to point out that, that our website is, is updated daily uh, with jobs uh, that, are, that, are, that are hiring uh, throughout COVID-19. Again, these are jobs that are actively hiring. We're building relationships with employers, connecting what their needs are uh, to, what, uh, to, to, to the job seeker, and then facilitating uh, those introductions. Some of those come, are closed very quickly. Some of them remain uh, open. But again, every single day, we're talking to employers, either updating, pulling down uh, posts, and or putting up uh, more. We continue to create uh, awareness, so we, we drive a number of campaigns. Not only do we have a, a social presence and a pretty good uh, internet presence, uh, but again, uh, we have a number of partners who we are uh, talking to uh, either on a weekly basis uh, through, our, through our Monday calls that we have with a number of partners across the city um, to one arm uh, of skills who is tasked directly uh, with partnering with, uh, with CBOs and some local universities to make sure that we are tracking uh, available opportunity and connecting uh, job seekers. Uh, lastly, on this slide, I really want to point out um, there, there's been a significant increase uh, in the number of CBOs uh, that we are working with. Uh, I mean, the, the, the partnerships are driving up. Some uh, organizations even have MOUs uh, with skills that really guides the way in which we are uh, aligning job seekers to, uh, to demand. Uh, but more ways that we're partnering as well as, you know, again, we, we have a, a, a a weekly call where we share data, right? A really important role that we played at the beginning of this was as we were learning, we also wanted to share that with the broader, uh, with, with the broader sector. And so not only were we talking about um, available jobs, right? We were also talking about how, how COVID uh, is impacting us, right? We were going over uh, the, the weekly unemployment uh, rate, both at the national level uh, and at the local level. And we were sharing what we knew uh, and we have a sizable uh, uh, audience. Uh, so folks are, are calling, are, are tuning into this call, not just one week, but subsequent weeks since we started uh, really ramping up these calls. Because again, as the business intermediary, what we're called upon to do is not just to share uh, the availability of jobs, but also to share uh, sector uh, information. Uh, and that's what we have been able to do uh, throughout this entire time. Uh, Jessica, can you take me through to the next one? Where I really want to align uh, here is, look, we, we find ourselves also being guided both by um, uh, Mayor uh, Lori Lightfoot, uh, but also by uh, Governor J.B. Pritzker, by both, uh, we're, we're ver watching their, uh, their plans for reopening very close. And so uh, I think this, this is something that I think we all have seen in some shape, form, or fashion. Uh, look, the, uh, the, the phase that we're in right now uh, we, we are in uh, relief, right? This is a very acute focus on uh, making sure that, that, that folks are safety, right? Or that folks are safe. These are the basic needs, right? As we're eyeballing, again, thinking about, you know, the, the, the broad recovery phase, um, you know, phase two is going to be how do we get people back aligned uh, with, with work and what's that work going to look like? 
And again, I think we're all uh, openly uh, waiting uh, for revival. And again, I, I know that the, the, the governor has a five-phase five plan, but as we look at this, the idea is, what are we going to do? What's the plan uh, as we sort of turn the corner and begin to focus not just on our acute safety and our acute health, but as the economy begins, sort of what we're thinking is going to be a staggered recovery, how do we ensure uh, that, that, we are, uh, that we are aligned? Uh, one thing I wanna to point to on this next slide is skills as of last year had uh, openly uh, sort of shared uh, publicly that, look, we, we've got an office in, uh, in the loop, 191 North Wacker, uh, we serve all of Chicagoland. The blue that you see on the left side is where we have the, the deeper the blue, uh, the, the more of an increased uh, presence uh, and the more increased placements uh, that we have. We took a look at our data and we saw that yes, we're serving all of Chicago, even into the suburbs, but we also saw that there were a cluster of neighborhoods on, uh, on the south side and a cluster of neighborhoods on the west side that we were significantly serving. Uh, to the degree of 51% of our, our folks that we were replacing were coming from a cluster of neighborhoods on the south side, uh, and above 20% uh, were coming from uh, uh, a cluster of neighborhoods on the west side. And so as we thought through that, as we thought through how do we make ourselves more accessible, how do we serve more people, uh, we, we came up with the idea uh, that was broadly supported that we wanted to go ahead and establish uh, an office uh, on the south side of Chicago uh, where, where people live. A, we wanted to reduce transportation barriers. B, we wanted to put ourselves where the job seekers are. And C, we wanted to increase and deepen our partnership uh, with CBOs that frankly have been in those neighborhoods uh, for, uh, for a very, very long time. But again, getting buy-in from them that we could be there, work alongside them, be additive, ensure that as they were making individuals job ready, that we could then uh, help to smooth the alignment uh, to employers. And again, we're looking at employers across the region, right? So employers in a loop, employers far north, west, south. We just want to open up uh, our employer partnerships um, to, to job seekers. And again, we will be uh, locating uh, in the, at this office um, in uh, sometime, once we get the, uh, the, the ability to, to move, uh, we will be in, in the south side neighborhood, uh, most likely Inglewood. Uh, and then we also have plans to, uh, to be by quarter four uh, on the west side. And so again, we want to continue to drive connections. So again, in the context of this conversation, before COVID, we were thinking about this. With COVID, it becomes increasingly more important to play this role where we are working with CBO partners connecting employers who are, at, while, we, while we're looking at this wave of, of, of unemployed, there's also frankly going to be a wave of employers who are going to come back. And we believe that they are going to need assistance with uh, aligning with talent. And we want to do that in partnership, not just with nonprofits, uh, but ideally with you know, folks on this call to make sure uh, that, uh, that, that folks have, uh, have supports uh, to go to work. Uh, I'll cut to the, to the next slide. The, again, when we talk about expansion, we're talking about expanding access. And so it's not just putting people back to work, it's addressing the technological divide. Uh, we know uh, part, part of this moment is going to be as we shift to a more virtual uh, setting, how do we really uh, ensure that everybody who needs to go back to work in this moment uh, can do that. Uh, this is something not just with our, our sort of neighborhood presence, uh, but also with our work moving forward, uh, something that we really want to uh, help uh, job seekers address either by coming through um, uh, our office or contributing uh, to this uh, in, in the field. Uh, I will say uh, this also helps us with, with social distancing. Again, the, the ability to uh, uh, to, to pivot uh, very quickly uh, to, uh, to virtual uh, allowed us to, um, you know, sort of be ahead uh, of where employers, uh, or at least align ourselves to where employers are headed. And again, our, our ability or our inability to be in office has not prevented us, nor has it prevented uh, partners in the sector uh, from driving people to work. But 
again, we need to uh, we need to grapple with the fact that look, th this could be our reality uh, 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 for some time. Uh, and again, one of the things that we want to bring to uh, to the sector in partnership uh, is thinking through not just what it's going to look like in 2020, but what's 2021 going to look like. And again, how can we sort of share our learnings uh, uh, with 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 others? Um, the last piece I, I want to add uh, here is uh, look. We, we believe that it's not just about uh, physical offices, it's about expanding, uh, expanding partnership. And the, the one thing that we've been doing uh, quite a bit uh, is yes, while we sort of look at, uh, at neighborhoods, it's also about partnering um, with, with other nonprofits uh, across the region uh, to ensure that again, anything that we have at our disposal, right? Uh, that we can make that accessible uh, to, to, to partners across the city. Uh, and especially in this moment, uh, as, as other practitioners are sort of saying the same thing, look, we, we want to be able to show, you know, bring, bring the kitchen sink and throw it. Um, this, this is quite a moment uh, for us all uh, to be rallying. Uh, and again, we're able to connect people now. Uh, we're able to connect partnerships now. And looking to the future, we really want to be thinking about uh, how we can best be additive uh, to the sector as workforce practitioners to again, connect job ready job seekers to actively hiring uh, employers and re smooth out those pathways and reduce all barriers that we can to ensure that people uh, can, uh, can go to work. Um, we have contact information here, but maybe I will pause here now uh, for, for any questions or comments uh, just about sort of the arc of what we've been doing uh, at Skills or how we're engaging um, uh, across uh, across the city. I am. Thank you so much for sharing that information. I just want to open up to let everyone know that you can unmute if you have a question or if you prefer to share your question in the chat. I'm monitoring the chat and happy to, to read the questions that come in there as well. Hi, uh, this is uh, Vanessa Ford at Academy of Scholastic Achievement. Can you guys hear me? Yes. You can hear you. Uh, hi. So um, my school is the School for Retrieved High School Dropouts. One of the things we were trying to do, even before this happened, was to align students so that after they graduated, they would have a trade and a job. Do you work with schools at all? We're on the west side, too. So I know you need to, you're talking about an office in second quarter, you said, um, fourth quarter on the west side. Yes. But are you working with schools in, in, in that regard? We do. Uh, we, we actually have a few different ways that we work with schools, both with um, we work with academic institutions, so, uh, so colleges, uh, but then we also uh, do have experience working uh, with high schools, um, both on the west side and, and into the loop, so absolutely. Are you, are you talking about driving people into careers? Because you also mentioned- um, Yeah, uh, uh, well, skills, yeah, skills training and jobs afterwards. So should I maybe reach out to you later and see what we can maybe talk about? Because again, we've been trying to do this for some time and have been looking for partners. So I'm actually excited about some of the work that you guys are doing. No, absolutely. That's a great question. And, you know, frankly, you know, this, I've, I've referred to the arc uh, a little bit. And again, this is, this is the arc that, that we see. Uh, you know, the, the importance of training uh, is going to be really high uh, right now, frankly, uh, and if I could be so bold, um, and, and it may be something that you, everybody in this call is already thinking, look, you know, Individuals, yes, they need training, but you know, folks aren't going to be getting on board very quickly with these long, drawn-out uh, trainings. And so, how can we sort of get the information, uh, get the training, uh, get folks to complete uh, a little faster so they can compete uh, a little quicker? Uh, is something that we're all uh, sort of looking at. And so, yeah, anything from uh, you know, you said trades, and I don't know if you said tech too, but those would be the ones that I would be pointing to along with healthcare. Uh, are likely going to be the ones that are going to very quickly um, continue, uh, rather, uh, to be in demand, but I'd love to uh, continue the conversation. Hi, and we have a question in the chat from Becky, wanting to know what strategies you're implementing to bridge the technological divide and really understanding this gap as it relates to adult education. Yep. So, uh, so we'll be learning uh, along this, and I think that can be uh, addressed in a couple of different ways. Uh, look, I think for, um, you know, for our offices uh, that, are, that are going to be located in neighborhoods, you know, one thing that we're, of course, going to want to offer uh, is, is access to, uh, to technology. Then the question is, what are we going to do with that? Um, 
you know, I think, you know, we're, we're still in planning mode right now, right? Like COVID has, uh, has clearly sort of uh, impacted the way in which we'll deliver uh, the learning. But um, look, everything's kind of on the table right now, right? Like without over committing the organization to anything that we, uh, that we can't do, um, look, we're, we're going to have a lot of time to, uh, to think through, um, you know, exactly what needs to be administered uh, to individuals. And obviously the ability not to sort of say, hey, we, we're starting a class next week and we want 50 people, we've got capacity for 50 people, is going to impact um, who we can get to. But again, we're, we're also learning, uh, A, uh, can we uh, figure out a way to get tech uh, into the hands of, of people as soon as the uh, shelter in place restrictions um, are, are, are loosened? Uh, but then B, um, we're, we're also searching for some innovation um, well, uh, of what we can do uh, in the moment. Uh, and we may have our hands tied behind our backs, uh, and maybe this is part of a broader conversation, uh, but we're, we're currently looking at that because we, we see a longer arc for, um, for reducing tech, uh, tech divides. And uh, I will say we, we have reached out to um, some tech suppliers uh, for, uh, for support um, uh, and assistance uh, with being able not just to provide the actual uh, devices uh, themselves, but also thinking about uh, what programming, right, uh, and what instruction uh, might a business intermediary, business intermediary be able to offer, uh, number one, or who might we partner with to make sure that uh, we're offering the right battery um, uh, of supports to ind individuals that are looking for a job. And we have another question in the chat. If you could speak to the barriers that are specific to women of color in the face of COVID-19. Yeah, so the one that really came up uh, or the one that, that sort of seems to be most, most prescient uh, for us uh, is actually wages earned. Uh, so again, I think I briefly spoke about, um, you know, th these, these jobs, uh, th there's this cluster of jobs uh, and you know, the, the, the ranges uh, vary. Um, but it sort of maxes out at $40,000. And this cluster of jobs um, includes, you know, minorities and women. Um, and, and when you're earning $40,000 uh, or less, um, your, your jobs right now are in this bucket that is 73% more vulnerable than all other jobs uh, uh, in, in the region, if not nationally. Um, so, you know, what that points to uh, is, I mean, amongst other things that we're seeing sort of play out, uh, among inequities, uh, gender inequities, just across the market. Um, there are many more uh, women uh, in these jobs uh, than not. Uh, and this moment has really uh, sort of illuminated uh, that. And what we are doing uh, about that, again, we want to be sure uh, to, to play our role. Um, you know, we're, we're not going to go through uh, and pick, uh, uh, pick individual, like we're not going to sort of that's not gonna be one of our screening questions, uh, but we do uh, wanna do, again, part of the role of, of, of business intermediary uh, is connecting uh, top talent to, to opportunities. Uh, and we do, we will over time, uh, see a number uh, of employers who are, who are responding. Uh, look, a majority of the folks that are served by skills, and in fact, I think nonprofits across Chicago um, are, are majority uh, women. And one thing that we're looking at obviously is how can we connect you to, uh, to the top job uh, for which you're qualified for? Uh, and employers too uh, are open to these conversations, um, a number of whom uh, we work with are, are actively looking at uh, DEI strategies. Um, and so we wanna play our role, um, but again, uh, would love to have a, a deeper conversation with anybody who is uh, penetrating uh, that idea. We have another question in the chat from V. Um, really glad that you mentioned health and we know that contract tracers are now in high demand, a bite for the short term. Um, are you putting together any partnerships as immediate job opportunities for unemployed or underemployed may be able to be connected to these opportunities to become contract tracers? We've actually taken um, inventory of, uh, of the trainings uh, for contact tracers. Um, I think there are some paid ones like the one at Oakton. Uh, there's also one at, um, uh, I think there's some free, free uh, trainings through Co Coursera and a number of others. Uh, there's actually a laundry list of, of contact tracers. Um, look, uh, I know a number of nonprofits, including Skills, have started to create pipelines. Uh, I know that the state uh, is looking at, uh, at contact tracing. Um, uh, local departments of public health are looking at contact tracing roles. Um, look, we, we wanna be ready. 
uh, we uh, are level with you on, on our website. We've create, started to create a pipeline, um, you know, sort of, you know, looking forward to the idea that uh, individuals, number one, want to do uh, these jobs. Uh, number two, uh, whether the employer is the state, local departments of public health, or the private sector, we want to start to build, um, you know, build that pipeline. Uh, we've been uh, as clear as we can uh, that we are creating the pipeline, i.e. Uh, the jobs might not be here yet, but those who are interested in working these jobs um, uh, would, would be sort of hopefully best positioned uh, by putting in their, uh, their interest. We're also sending folks to, um, uh, to, to the state's uh, website as well. Uh, so again, we want to make sure that folks are set up for the right opportunity, but wherever we can pivot, uh, and, and be helpful. We certainly want to bring, you know, uh, a list, right, of um, uh, of, of vetted uh, individuals who who should be ready to uh, to do these, do these jobs. And the nice part is, you know, a cursory look um, at the requirements. Um, you know, you don't need to have years and years of uh, of experience, right? Uh, th these are very accessible jobs. Um, you obviously need to be uh, uh, you, you need to be empathetic. Uh, you obviously need to be able to operate uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a CRM or a customer uh, a relationship management uh, software system. Um, but uh, look, the, the, the job requirements are not prohibitive. Uh, and uh, the one thing I like, frankly, about uh, one of the questions the state asks, um, have you been uh, impacted by COVID, right? So there's clearly uh, uh, an interest, right, in, in putting people back to work who have been uh, impacted by this current moment. But to your specific question, uh, yes, we are currently looking at those. Um, we want to help to drive people to uh, to these jobs. And the nice part is there are sort of tertiary jobs that are connected to this. So it's not just the, the contact tracer uh, themselves. Uh, there's this wonderful opportunity for folks who are uh, providing resources to also be included in that mix. And of course, the supervisory uh, and, and, and other roles that are going to come along with it. And so again, to the, to the point of, I think we're going to see some temporariness to uh, the labor market. Um, these are going to be the things that, that we're going to track. Um, you know, one of the things that we're actually talking about internally is how do we sort of support individuals over the short term? So if we get you or are able to connect you to uh, this initial job in this phase, uh, we want to continue uh, to be supportive to you uh, when these jobs sort of come to a close. Um, not the easiest thing for, uh, for any nonprofit who's involved in the workforce to be doing, but a role uh, that we believe to be super important uh, considering uh, what we're all experiencing right now. Thank you for that. Are there any other questions um, for folks who are on mute? Does anyone want to jump in with another question or share another question into the chat? While you're thinking of uh, maybe a, a last question or two, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to do an audible here. I see my, my colleague Daniel Cervantes uh, is is on the line. Uh, Daniel, anything that you uh, want to uh, make note of or highlight? Uh, good, good. I should say good evening, everyone. Um, I think the you know I've been hearing the conversation, and uh, just a couple of things I just wanted to add. Um, going back to the conversation around opportunity and the question also around um, the barriers that women face. You know, coincidentally, uh, just for context, uh, are the, the, the individuals that we've been serving, when you look at 2019 and the thir over 1,300 individuals that we serve, you know, 69% of those individuals were female compared to 31% male. And in the wake of COVID, um, whether surprisingly or not, Though that number has been actually slightly ticking higher, where we see more uh, women that have an interest uh, in terms of taking on certain opportunities that exist within the essential services. I think the one barrier in a conversation that I've been a part of on the employer side is um, how can we create um, avenues, pipelines for uh, women and women of color in particular uh, to get into jobs that are more tech oriented, because you have to remember that uh, in the conversations we're having, health and safety being at the forefront uh, in the wake of COVID, it's a conversation of with companies now starting to digitize the way they view their processes and, and, and things becoming a combination of less 
you know, face-to-face -face or in-person interaction, there is a set of skills that um, I think the job seeker will need to, to have, you know, in, in the new environment. And so we're having conversations around how we can bring more uh, women, women of color into these particular uh, avenues. Uh, the second thing I wanted to uh, say is uh, demand. So in terms of um, where we see uh, our conversations in the contact tracing side, uh, we recognize that there's a lot of uh, businesses that have the luxury of being able to work from home. And then you have those industries that don't have that luxury. And so we've been putting a lot of focus and attention around uh, manufacturing because you can't work from home, right, in that particular space necessarily. And so that's where we've been having a lot of discussions and timing around where, when, you know, production is going to resume at higher levels. And, you know, what is the quantity and the, the demand that will come from that particular sector? Um, as it relates to more of the office environment where you, where you have the opportunity to do work from home, we are having discussions around the evolution of certain jobs. Uh, I'm sure maybe you guys have heard the quote that um, as leaders, you know, as we start to sort of the return to the office and, and start to reopen the economy, many of us are going to have to become health leaders. If you think about, you know, sort of how we're making decisions. But I say that because we're working with a lot of companies like security companies that that role is going to evolve and has to evolve. There's one, uh, a few pilots that we brought on recently where they have um, started to put their uh, security members uh, through training to become contact tracers because they need to be prepared to offer that suite of services uh, to the tenants. So temperature taking, doing the contact tracing. So all that we see evolving in the roles that we're um, starting to, you know, pipeline for. We have another question that came in from Alicia in the chat. What is the most helpful thing non-workforce orgs can do to support workforce orgs as you prepare for the tsunami of clients? Should we do more to help prep or vet them as we send them your way? Danny, you want to get this first and I can follow up? Well, I'll make some because, I mean, this stuff is all uh, relevant to some of the discussions we're having now. You know, IOM and I have been involved in a number of discussions with um, various stakeholders. And in particular, what jumps out at me is uh, some conversations we're having similar to this in the philanthropic community where people are recognizing that there, there needs to be a, a, a better job of how we're bridging the gap between you know, workforce development and sort of the educational aspect um, of, you know, we have not only high school seniors going, you know, having to make decisions whether they continue on to college or go into the workforce and also graduating seniors, like, you know, what are the opportunities for them? Um, so those discussions are, are, are happening and I think there's a, a desire and a need and a call for there to be a more cohesive conversation between those in the education space and those in workforce. Uh, but in particular, as it relates to what, you know, would be most helpful for other organizations uh, to support is, you know, one uh, is around sort of a, a, a self-awareness and acknowledgement of, of preparing for what those particular, um, what the new, in, what the in industries that are sort of resurrecting and will come back sooner as part of the, the phased approach by the governor and the mayor. Um, and tr training is going to be huge. Again, at skills, you, you know, we've always fundamentally focused on the job first and foremost, but we're recognizing that, you know, the number, the wave of unemployed will completely outnumber, uh, uh, you know, the number of job opportunities available. And so I think the biggest thing we're communicating to the community organizations is that Make the make you know your clients aware that there isn't going to be you know um, immediate full time or part time opportunities. It may be that as pockets start to rehire, to be open to the fact of uh, on a contingent basis, because the important thing is obviously getting your sort of foot in the door. The other piece is around training um, and. It's also, you know, it's, it's, like I said, preparing for those different industries that will pop up, but also 
you know, getting comfortable um, with being able to self-manage, self-discipline, because many of us are going to be in this virtual environment and we're not going to have sort of your supervisor walking back and forth to check in on you um, and, and navigating those waters, right? How do you deal with conflict management? You know, maybe you have, you know, your kids are, are home, you're trying to balance work with e-learning and, and just navigating through those particular things, I think, uh, are, are things that, you know, we're now being forced to prepare ourselves in. I know at skills we're putting a lot of time and energy into that. Io? Yeah, so, I mean, that was awesome. Uh, look, what I would add to that, um, I think one thing that we are sort of talking about sort of at a, at a meta level um, is just how do we increase our partnerships? Um, I think the, the one thing that's gonna, that, that non-workforce orgs, nonprofits across the city, um, we should be continuing to generate partnerships. Um, so regardless if it's skills to, to another organization or another you know, organization, organization um, I think this is a time that we're really starting to think about how do we articulate um, sort of what our individual value adds uh, are um, to the system. Uh, look, I'll, I'll be selfish here for a moment. Uh, we're, we're always wanting to generate partnerships, either for individuals coming to uh, job seekers, coming to skills so that we can sort of support and place them. But again, as we're thinking about what this moment is going to turn into, um, you know, I think the conversation is going to be really important. Um, we certainly are, um, are allocating that time uh, to make sure that we're learning uh, alongside our partners. Um, you know, we want to understand not just what the needs are from, uh, from employers, but what the, the, the demands and the needs are from the people that you're serving. Uh, and again, we don't want to have to guess uh, at that uh, as much as possible. So sort of really setting up and formalizing partnerships, I think is going to be key um, because I think the, uh, you know, I, I think that the, that there's not just going to be one way uh, to tackle this. Uh, but again, the, the more that we're talking uh, through the solutions that are working and sharing those with each other, um, that I think is how we'll really prepare ourselves uh, for a um, uh, concentrated uh, response and a connected response uh, versus a, a fragmented uh, uh, one. Thank you both for answers on that. We probably have one time for one more question. If someone wants to share one in the chat or come off mute to ask a final question. Well, it's Alicia. I'll ask another one if we've got time. Um, I'm just wondering if you could speak specifically to folks with criminal backgrounds and the prospects for them as you see, um, you know, the, the larger picture and any thoughts on moving forward with that population since it's such a large percentage of our community. Yep. Uh, so individuals with, um, uh, with backgrounds or, or, or justice involvement, um, have uh, you know have, have always been on our radar? Um, uh, look, we we're, we're able to serve uh, job seekers that 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 come our way. Um, you know there there are certain investments that we're making um, into serving sort of at risk individuals uh, across the city. Uh, we do uh, actually have an investment in um, in a line of work where uh, we want to be connecting uh, individuals to um, uh, to work with a with a rather major uh, employer. Um, you know, I, I think there's, there's clearly more work to be done, but I think this speaks to the partnership, uh, that, that we have with, uh, with different organizations. Um, you know, maybe, maybe I'll also ask Danny to sort of talk specifically about, um, you know, some of our more recent investments in, uh, just involved individuals. Yeah. I think to, to respond to that, I think my, my first comment would be, or my first statement is that, you know, in full transparency, that is a that is a probably one of the most significant topics that at skills we've been talking about is around the fact that prior to covid um to some extent and i think maybe some of you may disagree but there's this, we at least at skills we're talking about how the philanthropic community corporations like various stakeholders we were starting to make some level of progress as it relates to justice involved in the wake of COVID, um, it's concerning. You know, I'm not going to lie. And, and this is why we're talking about it uh, a lot, about you know, suddenly with the influx of 
uh, a huge population on the supply side in terms of people seeking jobs. The progress that we made, what does that mean now? You know, and, and who's really going to step up from a DEI perspective, from a CSR perspective, and truly step up to the plate to continue the momentum that, that you know, some level of progress that we had made. As it relates to the investments that Skills has done, um, you know, th that, that is something that we've always been engaged and involved in. You know, a couple of things, uh, we've launched some programming and, 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 and continue to engage in programming, uh, whether it's with Chicago Cred, uh, with Story Catchers around a job readiness curriculum, life skills, and then also employment um, on the back end. Um, but I think, you know, what, well, again, I'm not going to give you an answer <laughs> uh, just for the sake of giving you an answer. I think we are literally now in a position where we are pushing our employers a bit more about, you know, this, this demographic, this group, uh, like how do we continue to make some progress? Uh, we have some employers and actually some of those uh, employers are represented on our board that have a strong commitment um, like the work that I own and I do with uh, Freeman Seating, uh, they are still committed, absolutely committed uh, to supporting Justice Involved and continuing to create opportunities. Um, but that is something that right now as we're sort of navigating that um, uh, COVID-19, uh, it's a concern that we have. Thank you both for those comments, Io and Daniel. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. I'm going to advance this slide because I want to make sure that everyone has your contact information and is able to follow up with you on this really important conversation. Um, thanks to you both and thank you to everyone who was able to join the call tonight. Um, if you are interested in continuing to be a part of this conversation, please keep an eye on our website and join our newsletter for more information about how we'll be responding to COVID. COVID-19. And if you missed any of our previous calls this month that focused on education or the COVID-19 response funds and some work that's happening statewide, please check your email and be looking out on our website as we'll be posting recordings of all of the calls. Um, again, Ioma and Daniel, thank you so much for joining us. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you, everybody.